So there's this salesman, and he's out calling on uh, businesses and uh, uh, drops in to see a customer. And he is surprised to discover that there's this large German shepherd emptying wastebaskets. I mean, he stares at the animal in disbelief. I mean, is his eyes playing trick on, tricks on him? The dog looks up at the salesman and says, hey, don't be surprised, this is just part of my job. Incredible, exclaims the salesman. I can't believe it. Does your boss know that what a prize he has in an animal, a dog that can talk? <laughs> Please, the dog replies. Don't say a word. If the boss finds out I can talk, the next thing he'll have me doing is answering the phone. <laughs> Sometimes, this is what it takes to make a believer out of a skeptic. Little faith is involved. It's seeing is believing. Little faith. Just seeing with your own two eyes, hearing with your own two ears, and then you can believe. Now, if you'd like to follow with me in the sermon notes, I'm going to take a look at a passage of scripture that concerns <coughs> this seeing and believing. It's the story, a well-known story, of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. I mean, in this story, the improbable has happened. I mean, this is a story that concerns believing. It's a story that concerns seeing. And what a miracle. First, let's look at death and believing, my first point. The beginning of the story. It tells us that there is a man named Lazarus, and it says, who was sick. Now, the fact that a man is sick is certainly not earth-shattering. I mean, let's face it, people get sick all the time. They get sick, some of them recover, and some don't. And as you know, this past week, my brother-in-law, our triplet, passed away. It was early Tuesday morning. Um, now, this did not come as a shock to us. Brother Art had been sick for quite some time. He'd been in and out of the hospital more times than I can count. And the last few episode, episodes have been pretty grave. He had a multitude of problems. Um, I wish you could have known my brother-in-law. He was a really nice guy. He was very positive. Great smile. I, I, don't, know if any, I don't know if he had any enemies. Everyone that met him and knew him, automatically, they liked Art. Great guy. On the morning of his passing, Tuesday morning, my wife was at the hospital with her brother, just the two of them, in this room. And, and moments before he drew his last breath, he looked up at the ceiling, and his eyes widened, and he kind of gasped. He saw something my wife couldn't see. He drew another breath, and then he was gone. My wife couldn't see what Art could see. I suspect it was Jesus. I think Jesus came to him and welcomed him into his kingdom. There's no doubt in my mind. Our triplet's in heaven right now. <laughs> but the story of his struggles with health problems, and uh, even the story of his passing, as, a, as as amazing as I believe it is, it didn't make it into the news because people get sick and people die all the time. Good people get sick all the time. In our scripture lesson, here we have a man named Lazarus who is sick. And what makes this particular man and his illness noteworthy is not so much that he's ill, but that his illness will be used as a spiritual lesson 
for all that seek wellness. In verse 4, Jesus tells the disciples that through Lazarus, the sick guy, God's glory will be seen so that even the skeptic will learn that he, that Jesus, is the Son of God. It reads, Lazarus, Jesus is speaking, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Now, when the disciples learn that Lazarus is sick, but that he's not going to die, I'm sure they're relieved. They know Lazarus. He's not a stranger. He's been close to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And the fact that the disciples are more concerned about the trip Jesus is planning for Judea tells us that they're really not too worried. In verse 7, Jesus says, let's go back to Judea. In the next verse, the disciples let Jesus know how excited they are about this trip. They're not even talking about Lazarus now. They say, Rabbi, why only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going to go there again? Forget about Lazarus and his health issues. The disciples are more concerned about some Jews who are determined to kill Jesus. So their concern is, why go back? Why jeopardize your life and return to Judea? <laughs> One year ago, March 22nd, 2016, there was a terrorist attack in the Brussels airport. Remember watching it on the news? A horrible terrorist attack, bombs exploding. Uh, 34 people were killed. Nearly 200 were injured. One of the survivors was a 19-year-old American. His name was Mason, is Mason Wells, and he's from Sandy, Utah. Now, if you ever bump into Mason, Mason Will, Wells, Mason Wells, if you ever bump into him, try to talk him into buying you a lottery ticket because this guy's luck is phenomenal. He is living a charmed life. The previous year, he was on a European vacation to France. At the same time, the terrorists attacked innocent people in Paris. And in 2013, he was at the Boston Marathon. His mother was running the race. He was at the finish line when two bombs exploded and he could feel the earth trembling at his feet. Only 19 years old, he's already survived three terrorist attacks. My advice to Mason is, next time you go on vacation, pick a safe spot. And that's what the disciples are thinking when Jesus tells them, let's go to Judea. And they respond in, in verse number 8, wait a minute, Jesus, you need to rethink this. The people over there, they want to kill you. Why do you want to go to Judea? Why go back? You've escaped death once. Why tempt fate? And besides, they don't like you. But Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. He's bringing the, bringing the disciples a lesson that I'm calling death, seeing, and believing. Beginning in verse 14 of the same chapter, Jesus explains to the disciples, Lazarus is dead. And then he says, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. 
Come, let's go see him. Lazarus is dead. I'm glad I wasn't there. Come on, let's go see him. Don't you find those words a bit strange? You would think that Jesus would want to be with this sick man so that he could comfort Mary and Martha. You would think that Jesus would want to be with his friend, Lazarus. And he would bring him healing. I like the way the Peterson translation uh, gives us the next two verses. It says, Lazarus died, and I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. You're about to be given new grounds for believing. I like that. Jesus is going to give them new grounds for believing. There had to be a death so that the disciples could witness the power of God. And there had to be a death so that we today might believe in the power of God. <clears throat> Jesus tells the disciples, come, let's go see him. Now, hold on to the pew. Listen how one of the disciples reacts. Now, this is important. Here is the real lesson about death and seeing and believing. Verse 16. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to and die with Jesus. Now, the answer that Thomas gives seems to indicate how much he loves Jesus Christ how loyal he is to the following. And this brings us to a place where we need to ask ourselves, how much do I believe in Jesus? How much do I believe? Would I follow him? Would I follow him if it meant it would cost me my life? Now the scene changes beginning in verse 17. I call this the resurrection and believing. Jesus and the disciples in Bethany. Now, the, the disciples have arrived for a funeral. Mary, Martha, family, friends, those that are curious, interested. <laughs> They've all gathered to mourn the loss of Lazarus. And in verse 19, it reads, Many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. Now, all the people are there to console Martha and Mary and to support them. And let's face it, if you've been to a funeral, why do you attend? Why do you go on visitation day? To console the, uh, uh, the bereaving, those that are bereaving, to give them comfort, give them a hug, Tell them you're sorry, you're praying for them. That's why they're there. It's a funeral. Jesus is there for another reason. He is about to address the question of faith. This unfortunate incident with Lazarus has given Jesus this opportunity to teach a lesson on the meaning of faith. This is a resurrection and believing moment. The theologian L.H. Marshall liked to say that faith was like gunpowder, which is composed of carbon, sulfur, and saltpeter, and each must be in the mixture before there can be an explosion. I thought that's a great illustration. Uh, that's certainly true with genuine faith. There are certain elements that must be present in order for faith to be complete. You've got to have trust. You've got to have loyalty. You must respond. And you have to have a certain amount of understanding and belief. You have to have a resurrection belief to have a solid faith. I was pastoring the Methodist Church in Romulus 
on September the 11th, 2001. And you know the significance of that date. There were four coordinated attacks by terrorists on our country, and our lives changed forever. Now shortly after the attack, there was a Gallup poll taken, and one third of Americans said that this event was a life-altering experience. And it was. I mean, for weeks after 9-11, worship attendance dratic, drastically improved. Fred, Joanne, you were there in the congregation after 9-11. We saw people we hadn't seen in a while. We were filling up the pews. People were coming to church. <laughs> the Gallup poll said that there was a 5% increase overall in church attendance. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, 5%, but believe me, it is. 5%. Churches are on the decline. And so to have a 5% increase, did it last? Well, recently there was another Gallup poll. And the indication is that not only has attendance declined, but it's lower now than it was prior to 9-11. I remember reading this and thinking, what has happened since 2001? Have we hardened ourselves? Are we accustomed now to terrorist attacks? Is it just day-to-day -day living? Oh, open the paper, another explosion, someone died, and now we don't get rattled. We're not rushing to church now. I think the reason why people are no longer pursuing spiritual things like they did right after 9-11, um, why there is not a surge of interest in church, is not because of a sudden resurgence in faith. It was a response to a crisis. That's all it was. They weren't exercising faith in God. Something bad happened, I go to church. But now, here I am in 2017, and I'm learning to live with it. Don't need church anymore. Their faith in 2001 was incomplete. They were missing a few elements. Let's go back to our Bible in verse 21. Okay, we learned that Martha has an element of faith. Martha believes that if Jesus had only been in Bethany a few days earlier, her brother would still be alive. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Now, Martha had faith in prayer. She believed that the prayer Jesus would pray to God the Father, who would get results. And Martha even had faith in a resurrection day. She believed that there was a day coming, the last day, when all believers would be transformed. But Martha, I believe, was still lacking a certain element in her faith. And so Jesus kind of takes her by the hand and says, okay, it's time to take a step forward and really believe so he tells Martha in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Resurrection is return to life. And Jesus is the author of that return. 2,000 years ago, it was true for Martha, and it's true today. Our faith in Jesus Christ can bring us back to a spiritual life. Once we were dead, but now we're alive. Once I was blind, but now I can see. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was bringing eternal life. He asked Martha if she believed and Martha answered that she believed that Jesus was the Messiah. She believed that he was the only one sent by God. 
but she was still lacking in a little bit of understanding. Her imperfect faith <coughs> kept her in the dark. Hey, it's not easy to believe sometimes when you can't see. It really isn't. I want to believe, but I just can't see it. Martha's spiritual eyes needed to be opened. You've seen the insert in our bulletin. Um, when I'm finished preaching, before we pray, we're gonna, we're gonna be singing this old hymn of the church. Open my eyes that I may see. I wanna challenge you this morning. When you sing this hymn, Sing it like a prayer. Let this be your prayer of faith. Oh God, open my spiritual eyes so I can see more. See more when I read scripture. See more when I worship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. See more. Be more. Open my eyes that I may see. Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. <laughs> I like that. That brings me to my last point. I call this seeing and believing. There's this fellow, Bob. He receives a free ticket from his company to attend Super Bowl 51 in Houston, Texas. I mean, Patriots against the Atlanta Falcons. On game day, he arrives at the stadium only to discover that his seat is on the third tier, tucked way up in the corner. This poor guy, he's in the nosebleed section. You can barely see the players. They look like just tiny little ants. He brought himself a pair of binoculars and so he's scanning the stadium, and lo and behold, on the 50-yard line, 10 rows up from the field, one empty seat. He's amazed. He says, I've got to take a chance. If I could just sneak down there, I'd have a great view of the game. He slips by guards. He climbs a fence, makes his way down to this empty seat, sits down. Guy next to him looks at him, and Bob says, I hope the seat is empty. And the man says, yes, it is. Well, now he's really excited. I've got this great seat. Uh, Bob again speaks to the uh, fellow next to him. This is incredible. I mean, who in their right mind would have a seat like this at the Super Bowl and not use it? And the man replies, well, actually, the seat belongs to me. I was supposed to come with my wife, but she passed away. This is the first Super Bowl since 1977, uh, since we got married, that it's just me now. Bob looks at the fellow and he says, boy, that is really sad. But still, couldn't you find someone to take your seat, a, a relative, a, a neighbor, a friend? The man replies, no, they're all at the funeral. <laughs> it's not a true story. Don't get upset. <laughs> they're all at the funeral. I thought I lost a member. <laughs> this, brings, this brings us to the seeing and believing part of the lesson. And it begins in verse 31. Now, you don't have this reprinted in the bulletin, so you're just going to have to listen carefully. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. <coughs> Everyone is there for the funeral. Mary, Martha, Jesus, a crowd of people, they've all gathered at the grave of Lazarus. 
They are all at the funeral. They're all there for a funeral. Except for one person. Jesus. He is not there for a funeral. And he gives the command. Roll the stone aside. Now, now listen to the reaction of Martha in verse number 39. Martha says this to Jesus, and she's protesting. She says, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. For Martha, and for everyone who is, is gathered at the tomb of Lazarus, seeing is believing. It isn't enough that Jesus already has given them assurance that he is the resurrection and the life. It isn't enough that Jesus said, those who believe in me, though they die like everyone else, they will live again. That's not enough. It isn't enough that Jesus spent time praying at the grave of Lazarus. Scripture says that Jesus prayed and it says, Jesus wept. Prayers of compassion. That wasn't enough. Martha and Mary and the crowd at this funeral need something else. And here it is. This is the seeing is believing. Verse number 40. Jesus responds by saying, Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Seeing and believing. Let, let, let me just read the remainder of the lesson now. Verse 41. You know the story. They rolled the stone aside. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing behind me so that they would believe that you sent me. And then I, I believe there was a pause. And it was quiet. And everyone was looking at the tomb and wondering, what's going to happen next? And then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. Come forth. And Lazarus steps out. Jesus tells a couple of the mourners, you go over there, you take the grave cloths off of this man now. And the miracle is complete. And what a powerful message has been delivered to all those who are standing there, all those who will believe. Now you would think that this miracle was going to have an amazing effect. Every single person, every man, woman, and child there, everyone is going to suddenly become a follower of Jesus. They will believe. They've seen a great miracle. This is how our lesson ends. Verse 45 says, Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. I remember reading that, and I read it again. I thought, wait a minute. Many? It doesn't say all. It doesn't say all believed, just many. And then in verse 46, some went to the Pharisees. Isn't that astounding? Many believed, but there was a group of people who had been a witness to this miracle, and they went off, they said, we're going to go tell the Pharisees about this. I think they refused to believe. I think they were still skeptics. They had witnessed the miracle, but they refused to see and believe the power of God. I'm finished. I've said everything I want to say about this, except maybe to ask you, what do you see? What do you believe this morning? When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, we will never perish. And amen.